Hey everyone, this is Adrian Battle Marston, and you are listening to another episode of TU Stories. On today's episode, we look to answer the question what does singing in a church choir and watching Don Cornelius on the hit show known as Soul Train teach us about diversity and inclusion. Joining with us today, we have one of our very own, Vincent E. Thomas. Vincent Thomas is a professor of dance here at Towson University, and his areas of expertise are in movement skills for men, modern technique, choreography, and composition repertory. He received his MFA at Florida State University and his BME in music at University of South Carolina. Vincent, it's good to have you here today. One of the first questions that we want to ask you is something that we ask all of our guests, which is, who is Vincent Thomas? Who is Vincent Thomas? I am the grandson of Warren and Mariah Brown, the grandson of Alberta and Johnny Thomas, the son of Willie B. Thomas and the late Georgia May Brown Thomas. I'm a brother, an uncle, a nephew, a godfather, a friend, an ally. I am a black gay male living in this place we call the United States of America. I come from peach pies and tire swings. I come from newspaper walls and dirt roads. I come from marbles and jacks, hopscotch. I come from creating games in the backyard with my siblings and my neighborhood friends. I come from the vibrating bosom of Big Ma, my grandmother, as I rested on her bosom and she sang hymns and songs. I come from collard greens and black eyed peas and cornbread the kind that you eat with your fingers. I come from love and love and hard love and deep love and consistent love. You painted such a beautiful artistic picture for who you are and what your story origins sort of look like, which sort of reminds me a bit on something that I don't think too many people know about you. So for those of you that don't know, not only is Vincent a dancer, but he's also somewhat of a singer. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I, I have been singing um, since as long as I can remember, I think I was, uh, I got that from my mother and my grandmother, especially Big Ma, because she sang a lot. And I remember spending a lot of time with her growing up as a kid. And my mom and dad was there as well, but with their working schedule, I know I was always in the care of grandma, as we often are. Um, that matriarch of a family. Um, so I, you know, I grew up singing in the church, and um, a crazy, a crazy thing. Like, if you knew me, you would know. So I'll share one thing that you may not know: that I also sang in talent shows as a kid. Like this was before The Voice or American Idol. <laughs> this was like talent shows that we had in the community. And my cousin Erlene Brown and I would sing duets of um, Peaches and Herb, 
uh, Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway and like all these um, famous and popular duo um, singers. And it was then that I, was, I realized that I was choreographing our movements. So as I think about the role of dance and how it has come into my life, it, it, it's been a long, long journey. And so, um, yeah, so singing and, and dancing from middle school all the way through high school was a huge part of that, of my life. But I did sing. And um, I actually went to college, undergrad, for music um, and was a, a vocal major, um, music education. So I'm certified K through 12 in music. Um, and I taught for a long time in elementary school music, um, teaching K through five, fifth grade. And I had a middle school honors choir. In addition to that singing, I was also singing in various church choirs during that time too. So singing has been a part of my life. I also believe that, it, and maybe I fantasize in thinking that Big Mom, Mariah Brown, my grandmother, was singing while I was in my mother's womb. And I'm sure she was. Yeah, so I, I do have a, a music degree. <laughs> and so I sing still, but now I think the, the singing is in the, the, the body sings. Like I know the body sings. The body creates um, music as well as painting the space. So music and singing is still with me. You mentioned that you sang a lot in the church. So I'm curious to know how often were you singing? How involved were you? And uh, for people that did go to church, you'll understand this reference. Did you get hit with the you'll be a pastor one day reference? <laughs> you know, uh, yes, I was singing in the church choir and singing solos as a kid. And at the same time, also reciting poems and doing these speeches for like the Easter program or the Christmas program or the summer revival or something. And I do remember elders in the church. Um, they were proper, um, prop, prop, propertizing that I would be a preacher. And... Um, and, you, you, you know, as a kid, you hear that and you, you know, it lands on you. And I, I think with some people, um, maybe there's a follow through with that um, for the church as a preacher. Um, and maybe they saw something really powerful in that delivery of singing or reciting a psalm or some poem or and, you know, as, as I got older uh, or of age and realizing that the trajectory of my path would veer away from the, the, fall, the four walls of a church in that convention. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I feel that I'm a... a a minister or a preacher of the body and how that platform is through my teaching. Um, I do feel, when you bring this up, I do feel that for me, dance and moving the body is so tied to life and the lessons that um, are learned, that are explored through the body are very applicable to life. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, in that sense, I am a preacher <laughs> through the body, through dancing. Yeah. So you shared with me in some of our previous conversations about the experience, even someone on, on a spiritual level, that people can have 
while they are allowing themselves to dance freely and expressively. And for your particular uh, experience, you are sort of emphasizing on men and male identifying students. What made you want to really focus in on that as your concentration? Because you could argue in some cultural or even some societal examples, that level of vulnerability to sort of just dance freely is not always accepted <laughs> is probably the best word that I could use amongst men. Um, because that sort of in, in some ways gets attached to femininity and that is not as always masculine, but you have sort of touched on the value that people can have across all different demographics and groups and classes on why that's so important for you to let your body experience something authentic like dancing. Um, like the first day of the movement enhancement skills for men class that I teach, which is a course for males all over campus. They're, none of them are, are dance majors, but they come from different disciplines across campus. Um, uh, and all of them have different physical expressions uh, or physicality and what they do. Um, but the unifying thing is that they are all born male. They're, they're males that come into this class. And one of the first things that I do is I have them to close their eyes and to move to music that the musician, Mr. William Goffigan, plays. And it's interesting to see the hesitation in their bodies to move to a groovy beat. <laughs> A beat that that really gets the t the foot tapping and the body swaying. Not all of them. Some of them do. And so, in that moment, in that very first class, it gives me a lot of insight about who's in the room, what are the joys, and what things they celebrate, and what things that they have <laughs> some hesitation about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I'm, I'm assessing all of this information. And so we, we actually talk about what does it mean to move the body unapologetically. Um, and I let them know that, you know, we're born with bones, flesh, blood, muscles, water, cells, all that stuff that the body is made up of, and emotions. And as, as I think about, so what is, you, you see it in movies and you, you probably can assume that the first thing that a doctor does or whoever delivers a baby, they will do what to a baby? They'll smack it or to, to, to get a reaction. The reaction is cry and what does that do? Um, and so is that reaction an emotion um, or what is that first emotion that um, a baby has when it comes out of the mother's womb or even in the mother's womb I think that there are emotions that are that they're experiencing um, maybe not having a name for it but there's a feeling that is there and so when we can accept and really believe that, yes, I come into the world with flesh, bone, muscle, tissues, fascia, cells, water, blood, and I come into this world with emotions. And that is something that, um, uh, well, I will say this, but then again, I'll take it back. I mean, that's something we can't, people can't take away from us. But it is something that I feel that sometimes we're socialized out of. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, and so for me growing up, um, I have I felt that I was always in touch with my emotions. Um, 
always. And I don't know if that, I mean, this is not a therapy session, but I don't know if that was tied to the maternal um, love and care that I was given or the paternal love and care that I was given or not given or not given in ways that I wanted or thought. So, um, yeah. And so finding this physical expression, I saw it around me. I saw it around me because I, I still remember as a kid peeking around the corner of our living room late at night and seeing my mom and dad and their friends dance to music, to like Al Green, to Percy Sledge, to Gladys Knight and the Pips, to the Tempt, like they were dancing to this music, males and females. And so I knew that males could express through their bodies. And then continuing on into um, middle, middle age, High school, middle school age, watching TV shows like Soul, um, Soul, um, Soul Train, where the first time seeing people of color, black people with afros like I had, look like me, moving their bodies, telling these physical stories in complete joy. <laughs> and I'm like, Yes, I can do this. And this is an acceptable thing for me in the world because I saw this on television, these black people doing this. And they were not the indentured servants or they were not, you know, the, and they were moving in their power without hesitation, without reservation. And so I bring all of that with me into my preaching body and when I teach and my, and my singing body, all of it comes out. You know, when you sing and when you dance, they're just emotions that are being um, uh, uh, put into the space by the voice or by the body. I think that's what, uh, they're spiritual emotions that are being moved into space. I moved my arm because the emotion that can facilitate that and give me a reason to. Um, I may sing because there's an emotion that's under the undercurrent that's bringing that out. So to be human is to be in your emotions, to recognize them. And what, you know, what is that saying? You know, you wear your heart on your sleeve or, you know, and is, is that a bad thing? <laughs> you know, I, I wear my emotions on my skin as though I don't have to have sleeves because sometimes I don't wear s sleeves. I, but on my skin, that, that vulnerable place is um, what I love and what I encourage students to tap into. So I wanted to talk about something that I think is pretty important for people to know about when it comes to your story. And that is you were actually the first black male faculty in your dance department. In fact, if my history is correct, you were the first black faculty in general in um, your department. So I, I'm curious to know what was that like? And what were some of the relationships that you've sort of had over the years? And what was that experience like for, for students? Yeah, you know, um, I, I feel that I am because my students are. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that I have to um, 
stand firmly in this power so that they can also see what is possible. You know, when I, when I got um, tenure and then subsequently full professor, it sent me on this, um, the memory reels kept flipping through and I was trying to think back to, okay, where did I have teachers or professors of color? And in middle school and high school, I had teachers of color, most definitely. In college, at the University of South Carolina, I didn't have any mm. professors of color in the music department. The, there were, they were all white. And my mentor, Dr. Arpad Daraj, was Hungarian. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't have that diversity in my college career, undergraduate. I did in graduate school, at, and um, that was with Anjali Austin, who was my ballet teacher, and the um, incredible Jawale Willa Jozaler. Um, but in undergrad, in music, I didn't have that. And I longed for that and didn't realize and know how to put it in words then that that was something I was missing and longing for. Mm -hmm. So when I have these the students here, I'm really clear that I've got a, I've got a responsibility to all of the students and a responsibility to the students of color not knowing if they've ever had, or if, if I'm the first professor of color that they've had. And what does that mean? Um, yeah, so, it, it, you know, but through that, my time here, you know, my wonderful colleague, Linda Denise fisher -Harrell, um, who also followed, and she became full professor before moving on to Chicago to be the artistic director of Hubbard Street Dance Chicago. Um, I do. I will say that our department of dance is very diverse. Um, we have a Chinese um, per, uh, lecturer, full lecturer. We have a Cuban. You know, so the the students are getting a real good mixture of um, faculty that look like them, that understand, that can be a source of eyes looking towards um, the horizon in a very supportive way for the students. So it means a lot to me. And I think it means, I feel that it means a lot to the students. Vincent, thank you so much for sharing a bit of your story here for our campus to learn more about you. Before we let you go, we do have one final question that we like to ask our guests. And our goal here is to provide more context to who you are and, and why do you do what you do. So Vincent, our last question to you is, what is your why? The why. Um, so what services on top right now is I, I'm, I look beyond where my hand is right now. I have to look beyond that and knowing and seeing that in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, hopefully there's a small impact that I've made we're working on a piece now around legacy. And so I've been thinking a lot about legacy um, 
what are the le the legacy shoulders that I sit and stand on, and why? What are the the legacy footprints that I'm stepping into, or the handprints that I'm put placing my hands in, and why? And and all of those things of value I carry with me, and I have to consider what am I leaving? What imprints am I leaving? And what a difference it may make for someone else. So for me, that's the why. It's, it's, I would love to say because it's the money, <laughs> but I want to be really honest. I, it's, it's, it's not. I wish the money was more, but it's because I care about people. I care about Humanity. I care about um, the world I live in and wanting to leave it better than where I am with it now. So when I consider that, that is my why. That's my why because I want the world to be better in, the, in small ways for generations to come. Thanks again for listening to this episode. If you'd like to learn more about other conversations that we have with other people on our campus, feel free to like and subscribe to this channel and be on the lookout for TU Today because we'll be posting when each episode will be premiering on our channel as well. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.